Good evening, brothers and sisters. May God bless you. You may have a seat. Tonight, we're going to be meditating on the Lord. We're going to be meditating on a passage of the Bible. And let's meditate to continue honoring God, to continue praising the Lord with the meditation of the Word. In Mark chapter 13, we will be reading there. And an affectionate greeting to all the brothers and sisters, especially the newcomers, those who have been coming to church just recently, and also a greeting to all of you. And here in Mark 13, let's meditate about our Lord Jesus Christ when he was working as a human being preaching, teaching the law of Moses and teaching the kingdom of heaven, teaching the gospel, teaching to the people, to a country known as Jerusalem, to a territory, a state known as Judea. Judea was a state, the capital was Jerusalem and the Israelites and all that territory perhaps they didn't have the opportunity of listening to the Lord but those who enjoyed were those who were inhabitants of Judea and Jerusalem that's what we read in the Bible however the Lord he sent his apostles and told them to travel to go around the territory of Israel and also to go around the world that they needed to go around the world. The apostles, they didn't have the opportunity of traveling around the world, but the rest of the people from there on, those who had converted themselves to the Lord, they have had the opportunity of traveling, preaching the gospel of the Lord. And now to us, God has entrusted us this beautiful work this is why we worry, preparing our hearts for God, learning, working the doctrine, and some are preparing themselves in languages, and some others preparing their hearts to, to see how God send them, sends them to evangelize. But we begin by evangelizing our families, our neighbors, those who are in our houses, and there we begin the preaching of the gospel of the Lord. That is the work that the Lord left when he told his disciples, go around the world and preach. The apostles, they couldn't do so. They could only stay in the countries of Europe, but all the area of America was missing. And here we are in America and God is with us. And how beautiful that the Lord is watching us. And the Lord, he is making us beautiful promises. And the Lord is giving us of his spirit, of his gifts, and also blessing us, blessing our spiritual lives, our material lives physically, blessing our health as well, delivering us, giving us peace in our souls and our hearts. That's what's beautiful. And we also want to tell the Lord to help us to please him and to work and to serve him. And in Mark chapter 13, are you there? And he reads, Then as he went out of the temple, Jesus Christ, and let's remember that the city of Jerusalem was the capital of Judea, and at the same time, the capital of Israel. And there, at the temple was there, the temple of the Lord was there. That was the temple that King Herod had built for the Jewish people there in Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus, when he was preaching, he taught the Jewish people, the Israelites back then, he taught them that they needed to respect the temple, that physical temple, they needed to respect it, venerate it, value it, because the Lord knew that that temple was the symbolic representation towards the future of the church of the Lord or the temple of the Lord, spiritually speaking, which is the heart of the believers. This is why the Lord made this temple, this physical temple, to be respected, and the Lord constantly would go to the temple and to preach and teach. So here, 
It reads, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here, referring to the temple, which was a beautiful place. It was built with fine stones, per perhaps marble. Those were the stones of that temple. And the temple was so amazing that he said, look at this temple. And the Lord told him. You see, the Lord Jesus answered and said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. This was very sad news for the apostles and for the people who were here listening. That the time would come when there will be not one stone upon another. And they, the temple will be destroyed. And now in verse 3, it reads, that Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives was very as a nearby place to Jerusalem, and he was there opposite the temple, outside of the city, the city of Jerusalem, and that city was a walled city. But the Mount, that Mount of Olives was a nearby place, and then it reads that the Lord in that mountain, he sat there to contemplate the temple. And then it reads that Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. And he then they say, tell us, Lord, when will these things be? So when is it that this temple will be destroyed? When are these things going to happen? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And the Lord tells them, and take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, the Christ, and will deceive many. So here the Lord was telling them that once the Lord would depart, that once he would ascend, that many Christ, many false Christ would appear, many false ma masters, false preachers, false teachers. And he tells them, this is going to happen. And in verse 7, there you may read so that you can help me. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. And those wars that the Lord was speaking about, he was referring to the wars that were going to come, because at that time the Roman Empire was governing and it ruled for 500 years. And the Lord knew that that Roman Empire one day will be destroyed. That other peoples were going to come and be in a war against the Romans to take the power. And at the same time, Jerusalem would be destroyed. The people of Israel would be destroyed as well. And this is why the Lord was telling them, that when you hear about wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For that temple, for the destruction of that temple, it is not the end for the destruction of the city yet. It is not yet the end for humankind. This is what the Lord was trying to say here. And in 8, it reads, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of what? Beginnings of sorrows, of tribulation. That is the beginning. Before the destruction comes, before everything ends, everything is over, the temple is destroyed, because what the Lord wanted to highlight was when that temple will be destroyed, until then would be the law of Moses. And then it would continue, the gospel would continue. But here he wasn't speaking this openly to his disciples because they couldn't understand this. And verse 9 reads, the Lord tells them, 
But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be bidden in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them, for the gospel's sake. He tells them an intent. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. So here the Lord was speaking about the end of the world. He tells them, first you must preach the gospel in all nations. Nations, before the end of humankind comes, you may read 11. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And then the Lord tells them that they were going to be there in the midst of the, these difficulties. He said, when? When they arrest you before governors and you are accused, don't worry about what you will speak because I will give you the words for you to defend themselves because no one will die but when God wants to. So the Lord, he was giving comfort to the disciples, speaking to them about the things that were coming for the end. And verse 12, the Lord says, Now brother will betray brother to death. So the Lord was telling them, look what is coming later on, when the Lord is not here. When he had risen up to glory, to heaven, he reads, Now brother will betray brother to death. Why? Because there will be a division of religious beliefs because some are the followers of Moses. Some others are, some are followers of the law of Moses and others are followers of the gospel within the same family. So brother will betray brother to death for changing his religion or father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death because they change their religion. We were used to practice the law of Moses and now you come with a gospel with a different doctrine. So you are worthy of death. This is why it states the brother will betray brother to death, father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And all of that because of religion that division will begin. And the Lord also tells them in 13, he tells the apostles, not only to the apostles, but also to believers in Christ that from there on will be, will come out. And it states, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end of his life shall be what? So he who endures to the end of his life shall be saved and this commandment until today is current and valid until today the holy spirit tells us that we must continue until the end that we must continue and that we must reach where the goal that we must persist and endure until the end of what until the end of our lives because the day that we die that day we will reach a goal if we walk with God the day that we die we say I reached the goal glory to God I did the work that God entrusted me to do I followed the Lord I walked in life 30 years 40 years 50 60 70 years of life that God gave me I live them with joy and now I live I left this world and I reached the goal that is what we must desire desire to reach that goal to follow God, to read the Bible, and to learn to pray, to learn to seek God, to learn to prepare ourselves for God, to learn to please the Lord, not to get tired halfway through, or to say, oh, I am bored. 
This is so boring. Because there are people who come only for God to solve a problem. They come for healing. They come for God to give them health. For God to remove an illness. They come for God to give them a job. To give them a place where to live. To help them to organize their lives. To give to pay off their debts. Well, and so many things. So there are persons who come just for that. Instead of coming and saying, I go because I want to praise and glorify God. And thank God because I love Him. Because in my poverty, in my needs, in my necessity, I love Him. And also in richness and in abundance, I love the Lord. And this is why I go to church to praise Him, and I continue in the way of God to worship the Lord, to give the glory that He deserves in poverty or in abundance, in illness, in health, in all times and aspects of our lives. And we must not be self-seeking. I go to church to see what He tells me, to see if I will get married or not next month, to see whom I am marrying to see if I will get divorced or not, if I can get married again and see what happens. No, brothers and sisters. That is not how God wants us to come to church. God wants us to come to church with a willing heart to glorify Him and to jump out of happiness to sing to the Lord, to tell Him beautiful words to the Lord, to praise our God. This is why we must come. The rest, the Lord, He will work. The Lord knows that you need many material things. God knows that you need that your marriage is a happy marriage. He knows that you need understanding in your family, home, family, food, job. The Lord, He knows that you need health in your body. The Lord knows that. Therefore, let's not put our hearts on the interest let us not be self-seeking instead let's give to the lord the honor for he is worthy of that and selflessly let's come to seek him and this is how god as well will pour showers of blessings on each one of us and we must say oh lord how long am i going to live i don't know but the years that i live i must walk in your way Praise you, glorify you, Lord. Even though my family, even though they don't accept me alone, I will seek you. I will praise you and I will reach the goal. I will reach the goal, my Lord. That is what we must fight for. We must fight for this. Wherever we live, whichever country we live, whichever country, we, country or culture that we live in, therefore, we must value our God, value what He's doing for us since He is congregating us here. He is manifesting Himself in the midst of us. Let's value that word of the Lord. Let's value our Lord. Let's value everything that the Bible states because God, He's giving life to this in the midst of us. And here we are in verse verse 14 when the Lord tells them that they were going to be hated and he who endures to the end shall be saved so here in verse 14 here speaking to the apostles so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and I don't know if you have read in Daniel 9.27. A brother, if you can find Daniel 9.27, some other brother 11.31, and another brother 12.11. He who has found 9.27, you may raise your hand. Well, you may read. We're in a loud voice, brother. So pay attention to Daniel 9:27. What does it read? Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, 
even the consumption which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Well, so it reads in Daniel's prophecy, God was revealing to Daniel what was going to happen in the future, and the future was the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he was speaking of with his disciples. So the Lord says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, he who has an ear of God can understand, and he who doesn't cannot, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That abomination of desolation, but... Wait, some brother read 1131, Daniel 1131. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And it reads that forces were coming, so it is speaking about a war. Forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall be there destroying the temple of the Lord that back then was the temple of the Jewish people built by King Herod and the Lord Jesus Christ. He had made it to be respected, and it reads that forces shall be mustered, and they will defile and destroy, and they will place the abomination of desolation meaning attacking what was inside of the temple. But before continue to explain 12.11, what does it read? Daniel 12.11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Thank you. And those 1,290 days are symbolic. They are not our days of us human beings these are the days of God that, not possibly, but they were years. Those 1,290 days were years. And he reads, based on what Daniel was prophesying, that war was going to come. And the Lord Jesus here is saying the same thing. There will be a day where not one stone shall be left upon another of the temple. And the Lord says, when the abomination of desolation that Lord spoke of, you must be careful, be cautious, and you must flee the city. Because war is coming. A war is coming and forces, troops, armies are coming to destroy Jerusalem, to destroy the temple. And when they go into the temple, they are going to attack and break the rules that God had taught to Moses about respecting the temple. And that temple had three different places, the most holy place, the holy place, and outside the court. The court. And God had said that to the most holy place, nobody was able to go in, but only once a year, the high priest. But when the troops came, the armies of the pagan nations who came to fight against the Romans, it reads that the first thing that they did is that they went into the temple, they defiled it, and they attacked the defiled the most holy place they destroyed the temple and they took everything that was in there so there they are attacking the temple and that is what is known as the abomination of desolation that they were doing all these things against the temple that god had established and that they needed to respect and therefore they destroyed with everything and we don't know what else did they do inside of the temple so the lord said when that happened you must flee from jerusalem flee go and hide yourselves because there will be death men and women will be killed and there will be no respect from and for any human being flee so that you are protected, the Lord said. He told them to do that because if they would stay in the city, they would perish. And that is the abomination of desolation. That is that when they would see those troops or those forces going into the temple of the Jewish people, 
that was not valid anymore because they had profaned or defiled the temple. And after being profaned, the destruction would come fires. And there it was fulfilled what the Lord Jesus Christ had prophesied that there will be a day in which not one stone shall be left upon another. And the Lord gave them as a sign the prophecy of prophet Daniel. Prophet Daniel, from what we read, he prophesied that that abomination of desolation would come into the temple, those forces to the temple, and they will be destroying and disrespecting what was inside of the temple. And this is what happened. So the Lord here, he tells them, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the house stop, do not go down to the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. And in 17, he reads, Oh, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies, those who are raising their newborn children in those days. The Lord, he was being considerate of that situation, but that happened. And pray that your flight may not be in winter, for it is during winter people will go out and they will die out of frozen. And those who are pregnant and those who are nursing children, helpless children, then they would suffer death by the sword. Verse 19, you may read. For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. Tribulation, of course. How not? The destruction of cities, death, And here in 20 it reads, And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened those days. Here the Lord, we see that God put his hand also in those days because there were many who had converted to the gospel and God, because of his love, He says that he permitted that war to last only a while. And history tells that four years after the Lord Jesus Christ rose to heavens, four years later, war came to Jerusalem and Jerusalem was fulfilled. And this was fulfilled what the Lord said here. 21 reads, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is a Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For you may read 22. For... False Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. For false Christ, false prophets will rise. They will show signs. See, they do show signs and wonders, the false ones. They will show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, if possible, even the elect. And all of that happened happens and will happen that from that time false christ false prophets false teachers false masters false preachers they have risen in the world and they are still in the world and some perform miracles some perform miracles do you know why because the devil has what has power, and the devil uses them to perform miracles to deceive people. And it states here, to deceive, if possible, even the elect, the elect ones of God. But no, they won't be deceived, for the elect ones, God protects them and keeps them. But he reads, if possible. So how are those great wonders and miracles, the way those deceivers manifest themselves? that the Son of God doubts. He says, oh, does he have a God? Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. He's moving a man to the sea. He's walking on air. He makes people to walk on air. He makes them levitate. He makes the dead rise and walk. See what he does. Does he have power of God? Well, that is the power of the devil. And the Son of God begins to see, and since he knows the doctrine, he won't be deceived. 
he won't be deceived by all these great deeds that people do because I even hear that there are people who ban metals and they look at things and they make things to move from here to there and we have heard all of that in the world and those are the false ones that the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking of and it states if possible to deceive if possible even the elect but we love the Lord we are sincere with the Lord he won't allow us to be deceived by the devil even though we see that others do so much magic and so many things but we won't be deceived because God he doesn't care about magic and he doesn't care about people walking on air and levitating what the Lord wants is that people are happy that they have peace and happiness and people are saved and they love God that is what God wants that is what God wants from us and also that That is the reality that we want from the Lord. What is it good for that if people walk on air? If they're not happy, if they commit suicide later, if they don't have peace, if they don't have God, then what is it good for to walk on air? It's worthless. We must be realistic, practical, realistic, reasonable for the devil not to deceive us and the devil won't deceive us. The Lord said all these things, all these things were fulfilled, have been fulfilled. And the Lord reads, the Lord says, 23, but take heed, see, I have told you all things beforehand so that you know and you remember that I had warned you about this. So that is today's meditation. I don't know if you understood. Did you like it? I think that this was so beautiful, this meditation. Because it makes us to have more conviction that we fall in love even further with the love that we love him and that we desire to come to praise him, to worship him selflessly with no materialism, with no self-seeking, selfish interest, but to love God in poverty, in wealthy, just like those vows that you take when you get married. So we're going to do the same. We're going to take those vows. I will love you, Lord, in happiness, in sadness, in gladness. In all times of my life, I will love you, Lord. Well, I know that you have questions. Good evening, Sister Mary Luisa, and welcome, you and all those that are with you. I've had this question for many years, and it is regarding the doctrine. The Lord always announces about giving a, a, you uh, your ideal spouse that you will work side by side in the church. Well, I think that that turned into a pet phrase or a filler. A pet phrase or a filler that all oh, that you will work shoulder to shoulder and that turns into a filler. So let's be practical, let's be realistic and reasonable. Yes. And so my question is, I, when I first came to church, I heard a sermon saying that marriages in church are meant for a testimony, not only for the church, but also the world to serve the Lord. And through these years, I've seen many married couples who have gotten married here in church who have had received spiritual gifts. But I've also seen that either of the spouses grow spiritually, starts to seek the Lord constantly, serving God. And you can see that that person is greatly supported by the Lord. And then the other spouse is not in the same condition. So I would like to know what is the reason for that? Does the Lord allow that? Uh, to that other party for um, his partner not be at the same level to, for, to have mercy? Or how could you reach that point where both of them have a marriage that is truly one where both of them are dedicated well, for the honor and glory of God? Let's remember a passage of the Bible. And the Lord Jesus, in one of the Gospels, the Lord said, And there will be two people in one bed. We understand this is a marriage. There will be two people in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. And that says a lot. It tells us that not all the times a marriage, a couple, Both will serve the Lord shoulder to shoulder. That's not true. 
That is a lie. Because some, as the sister says, some believes and the other doesn't. One progress spiritually and the other one didn't. So one will be taken and the other one will be left. And if they reach the goal, the one who prospered and who obeyed God will live with God. The one who did God's will and the other one, even though he was his couple and they slept together, this person will have to stay and will be separated from God's presence. That is what the Bible mentions. This is why God tells us that we are individual. That each one of us is a singular world. And I alone go before God's presence and render accounts to the Lord. But I cannot go to those who are with me. Not with my couple, my children, my cousin, my parents, none of that. It's me alone. The person presents himself before God to show God his deeds, the ones that he did in his life, and the Lord he will judge and reward or make him pay or punish accordingly. So in the congregations, we will not expect both to serve shoulder to shoulder. One will, perhaps, and the other won't. And I admire, and we are going to congratulate the couples that both, shoulder to shoulder, will be serving God. That is admirable, and that will be of congratulating. The rest is just a phenomena that happens in the church, and we aspire and we desire that everyone converts. But that's the reality that it doesn't happen with all. Some do, some don't. But we say, I want to get there. I want to get there to that place. We continue with another question. Yes, brother. Good evening, sister. My question is regarding the day of Pentecost. I had an experience at home. Some Jehovah Witnesses uh, knocked on my door, said they didn't speak in, in tongues because they spoke English and Spanish. And I said to them, well, wait a second. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit, when you speak in tongues, there's to, angelical tongues. To speak English and Spanish, you have to study. Well, angelical tongues, we don't have to study. The Holy Spirit takes us and we start speaking tongues. So I don't have to study or to take a class. For the other languages, you need to take a class. So what a difference. What a difference. So there are people who speak five languages. They speak French, German, Portuguese, Italian. Well, we congratulate you. But they had to study. They had to take a class. Well, angelical tongues... You don't have to take a class. So the brother, what did you explain? And so my question is as follows. On the day of Pentecost, I'm sure there were many miracles, many miracles through the apostles, through Mary, with all of them that were there. And in addition to those miracles that they experienced, did they also spoke in that those yes, languages? Yes, of course. Yes. That day of Pentecost, it states that there were meats, Persians from Babylon, where else? Elamites. They were from all the nations. Every people spoke a different dialect, a different language. Every people, they spoke a dialect. Let's say here in Margate, we speak a language. For Lauderdale, they speak a different language. In Western, they speak a different language. So it is in Europe, and so it was back then. Each one had their own language, different dialect. So God, to manifest himself and to convince them He made the apostles and his people, who were 120, who were there that day praying to the Lord, and they spoke in the language of every person to convince them. But also that day that happened as well, but the Lord, he also gave them angelical tongues because from there on the Lord began to give angelical tongues because it states that these are tongues that people couldn't understand. And Apostle Paul teaches he who speaks angelical tongues cannot understand what he is saying. Pray for interpretation. And if there is no interpreter, then pray for yourself and for God, but don't pray in a loud voice the tongues because no one will understand. So here we find this teaching as well. Are they based only on the day of Pentecost? But they are forgetting about the Acts of the Apostles and in Corinthians, what Apostle Paul teaches about this. They forgot or they have not read. 
they only they would only refer to that particular moment of those tongues and of those of those languages, but they don't understand that there are angelical tongues. So I that they said that no, that that is something for the past. I said no, it's for wise. today. They are very wise because then God didn't have that power when God said that it will be forever. The Lord Jesus, in John, in the gospel, according to John, he made a promise to the disciples and tells them, I will leave, but I will send a helper, the spirit of truth, the one who will teach you all things. He will guide you into all truth. He will tell you, tell you what to do, and he will be with you forever. He didn't say a hundred years, a thousand years, but forever. What does forever mean? Me. That means that whole generation and the whole, all humankind would live. So we tell them, let's not argue about doctrine about this. Let's not doc. Let's not argue. Look at my business card. Go. I go to a church. There, God manifests Himself. Are you happy? Or are you bitter? Are you sad? Are you in despair? No. There, where I'm going to, God gives happiness and peace. That is what matters, the peace that the Lord gives us. And God manifests himself. He makes beautiful promises, and you will be happy. I invite you to church. It's best to speak this way and not to argue about the doctrine because no one will be right. No one will believe. They won't believe me, and I won't believe them. So I better invite them to enjoy, to experience what I am experiencing in the church. That's the proper way. Yes, sister. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening, sister. Yesterday, I was listening to a sermon from the church in Las Vegas, Colombia, the broadcast, live broadcast, concerning discernment. This preacher was talking about discernment and as far as discerning between good and evil and the things of God. Also discernment as a spiritual gift, a spirit, uh, discernment to cast demons out. And also discernment for the spiritual things. And I have a question about intuition. Could we label this also as discernment? Thank you very much. Well, discernment, what is discernment? It states that to discern, it is to know how to distinguish. To discern, it is to distinguish the behavior of a person if this person is good, bad, if this person is neurasthenic, is conflictive, if this person is well-behaved, misbehaved, if this person is rude, contentious, he is meek, he is simple. We say that about people, right? That is known as discernment. In a certain way, we are distinguishing the behavior of somebody. And when God says, that among the spiritual gifts, to some he will give the gift of discernment of spirits, that's something else. Because there are persons who have evil spirits in their bodies. They have deceiving spirits because of witchcraft, because of sorcery that were in the past, People perform witchcraft sorcery, and there were curses, there were spells. And then those spirits come and they attach to a man, woman, child. And they come in bonds, and those spirits do not let the person to be happy. They don't let them to reason, to have a, an emotional stability. But the person is changing, variable, cannot found himself, cannot understand anybody. Nobody can understand them because they become conflicted for those spirits are there in the person. So the person comes to church and those who have the gift of discernment, when they speak to the person, when they listen to him, when they greet him, when they offer his hand, when they spend time together or socialize, then the gift of discernment tells you this person has spirits. 
This person has many bonds, many spirits disturbed. He's disturbed by spirits. I will pray. I will lay on my hands. I will tell him to be patient, to be careful, to not to be conflictive. I will be patient with him as well. For when people have these spirits, they are conflictive as well. They're stubborn. So others are angry. They feel uncomfortable. They do not tolerate. For they don't have the gift of discernment, they cannot consider. He who has the gift of discernment discerns, distinguishes what is in this person, his behavior, and starts to be considerate and to be patient with him and to pray. That is the gift of discernment of spirits. Because we are a spirit who God gave us and we dwell in a physical body. But aside from that, there could be evil spirits who can come and attach to us. Spirit of laziness, sleepiness, hatred of robbery, the spirit of laziness and so many spirits. The spirit of madness, spirit of lack of reasoning, spirit of Alzheimer. The spirit of losing your memory. Well, so many spirits. So he who has that gift will discern what is in this person to pray for them and to lay his hands on them. And that is what we know. And God gives the gift of the sermon of spirits. How many spirits do you have? Remember the Lord Jesus Christ asked to one who said who had many demons. And the Lord tells him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And legion means 2,000 demons. So he says, my name is legion for we are many who were inside living in the body of this poor man. And the Lord delivers him. And those 2,000 demons need to leave from there. So that is the gift of the sermon that God gives us. Also, there is another part of life where we can discern things. We're no longer going to discern spirits, but to discern, that is to distinguish what's good, what's bad, behaviors, what should I do, should I do this, shouldn't I? Yes, you should do it. Yeah, behave well. Don't do this, don't do the other. That is a discernment natural that human beings have in life to make decisions to give advice, counseling, or to do things right, or to teach people to do things right. Therefore, there are many kinds of discernment. And what the sister said about intuition, so it is that discernment, intuition. I have the ability to do things, and I think I can do things this way, and things will come out this way. And I did it because I had these ideas, And I did this, so we can call this an intuition, a discernment of doing things well. But the Lord, he speaks about the spiritual gifts, which is the discernment of spirits. The others are natural things of a person. To know how to do things well, to know how to think, to know how to do a job, how, to, how do we do a task well, to know how to make decisions. That is, it's something else that's different. The spiritual gift that comes on behalf of God, the discernment of spirits. Let this be clear. Let this concept be clear to us and these topics. Let's continue. Any other questions? Sister, good afternoon. We're very happy to hear all the brothers and sisters from the church in Margate because the Lord moved you to come visit us. Thank you, sister. I have a question in the Bible in Genesis chapter 44. Yes, sister. Verses 4, 5, yes, and 15. Verse 4 of chapter 44 states, When they had gone out of, out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. And then verse 15 states, And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Sister Maria Luisa, you have taught us that Joseph And for those was who read the Bible, what is this sister reading? The story of whom? 
of Joseph when he lived where? In Egypt, right? It's best if we know the context to be able to understand. Yes, sister. And so, Sister Maria Luisa, you have taught us that Joseph was the antitype of our Lord Jesus as, Christ. As the older brother only. So why in this part of the Bible says that he practiced well, divination? Why did he say that? This was a strategy because he was in Egypt. His brothers had sold him since he was a child and he was in Egypt. He had not made himself known to his brothers and he wanted to get revenge from his brothers for the bad thing they did to him and he was preparing vengeance. And this is why he told the messengers, go tell them that why did they steal the silver cup? And the cup that he was using to drink, it's a cup that on purpose, he put it on the wheat sacks because he wanted to get revenge from his brothers. And he says, go tell them that I used that cup to practice divination. To, co to confuse them even more if in case they suspected that he was Joseph, his brother. So he did it because he was being mean. He was being mean because he wanted to get revenge from his brothers and who wouldn't want to take vengeance after all the things that they did because he lived as a slave for so many years in Egypt. Then God blessed him and he ended up being the second one after the king and God blessed Joseph. So this is what he did. He didn't practice divination. He did so to confuse them. And then he makes himself known before his brothers. After he took vengeance, he made himself known. So they had to kneel down and ask for forgiveness. That is what happened. Well, is there any other question? Yes. Good evening, sister. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. I have a question. During a Bible study, you were teaching us about our genes and our flesh, the fact that our flesh carries many things, envy, and it's all within it, and it costs to leave it aside. Inheritances? Yes, our inheritance. And so a question comes to mind, because you were explaining about discernment and the spirits, and we have a lot of spirits. So when can you tell that you blame the flesh or the, their spirits are the ones responsible? Or if that's the inheritance that we have from Adam and our flesh? But the inheritances with those genes, those genes that turn into spirits, because children inherit many things from parents and grandparents. And we say, well, the father, he was quick-tempered, and the grandson is quick-tempered as well, or the son is quick-tempered. It looks like that when the father died, the spirit of wrath, the one that he had, that wrath of being wrathful, the spirit leaves and gets into the child, it looks like. Well, there, we don't understand, we, know how, we don't know how, but the, th the fact is that things turn into genes. So the father liked onions, but the other one hates onions. And the other one, he hates onions as well because his grandfather didn't like onions either. So these things happen, and I think this has happened to you, that children inherit certain habits and behaviors from eating and and you say well this is how his grandfather was his grandmother was and genes that are inherited and i think that there are in part is spirits that go from one person to the other and they turn into genes we don't know how the fact is when we come to the knowledge of god and if we bring bad behaviors we must pray to god to remove this remove genes or either spirit whatever it is Please, whatever it is, those bad things, I don't want to have them in me. The good, yes, I do want. I like to have the, well, I would like to be like my father because he was kind and I want to be kind because he was kind. So I like this. Oh, the father, he was rude. No, I don't want to be that. I inherited that. But Lord, please remove this. Rebuke that demon from my life. Remove that demon from my body of wrath, of strifes. Remove that. Whether it is a gene or a spirit, remove that. So we change. The Lord changes you. Or at least you moderate and you control yourself. Because we know that we have to please God. So is it the same you know, the, the, to the flesh? When you say that it's hard for your flesh? Yes. 
of the flesh. It is difficult for the flesh to change in these acts, but it is possible because the spirit that God gave me, which is the conscience, that personality, dominates my flesh. I want to dominate my flesh. So my flesh wants to do all those genes and customs and what's wrong, but I say, no, why? I need to control myself. I need to pray to God to deliver me because I need to please God. So there we start to fight with our flesh, with our desires, the ones that we have, and we fight to say, no, that's not good. That doesn't please God. I will control myself. I will not do that. Just like when a doctor tells you, he gives you a specific diet, you're sick, and he prohibits what you like to eat. So what do you do? You sacrifice your flesh for your health. To obey and for your health, you sacrifice. So one sacrifices his own flesh. Sister, good evening. God bless you. Thank you, sister, for your beautiful willingness that you give us understanding as to how to please and reach and attain that knowledge to please God. Thank you for your willingness. I have a question in Psalm 89. Psalm 89? Yes. Yes, sister. Starting verse 14. Yes, you may read. Thank you, sister. For honor and glory of the Lord. It reads, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the whole, the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our king to the Holy One of Israel. My question, sister, is I'm grateful to God because, because I've been able to meet the manifestation, get to know the manifestation of a God who speaks to us, a God who leads us, a God who has changed our lives because we have truly understood and I can say thanks to you, sister, because we can know a lot of God. My question is, with all these verses, what would be for you to give us an answer or were to for us to become the true children of God who could day after day meditate on the greatness of God and day after day reach the growth he has for us and the power he has for the church? as the true children of God. So the question is, what should we do? Or what should be we do to be, to be that? Followers of God, people who please God. First, it is to love God, to love Him. Because if we love God, we want to please Him. To love, to value God, to acknowledge God, to desire to please God in all, that is the first step. For the rest, which is difficult, God will help us with that. God will help us to love Him, to do His will, to please Him, to fulfill His commandments. He will help us. For He sees that within our hearts there is love for Him, the fervent desire to do His will, and that is what God rewards. He rewards and He sees the heart. This is why the Lord says that He looks at the heart of man. And based on the condition of the heart of man, of a woman, the Lord will help him or her to do what He wants to and what He desires to do, to please the Lord. So those two things go hand in hand, to love the Lord, and to desire to prepare ourselves for the Lord, to please Him in all, and then He will help us to dominate our flesh, to humble ourselves, and to stop doing what's wrong, for the Lord will prepare us for that. Well, the last question, last question. Sister, I would like to see if you could talk about free will. 
Many people, many of the brothers and sisters, they say, for example, that they have to wait for for the Lord to to tell them whether or not if they should read a, a room or they thank God for the water He's giving them. And I I think that they're belittling Him. And so I would like to maybe if you could explain to us well properly when it comes to free will, how could we go about? Yes. So the sister says. We are belittling the Lord, for we're expecting God to tell me if I will rent this room or not, if I will rent a car to move around or not. So the sister says they are belittling the Lord, for these are decisions that we can take, that we can make decisions. That is the free will to make our own decisions, and we already know our duties as human beings. As human beings, we have duties that God established and left for men and women. He told men and women, work so that you can eat, work so that you can live, work so that you can get dressed, work so that you can build a house and you live under a roof, work, make a living. He also gave duties to women. That's it. That's the free will. Therefore, we must make our own decisions about our duties. We will not wait for God to tell us, go and find a job. Go and apply there in that store or in that restaurant. Go and apply there. No, because we already know what belong, what we have to do. We must apply to jobs where I feel prepared and able to perform. So I apply there and I wait in God for him to help me and to open doors. That's it. And we say, Lord, please open doors. I applied five different times. Please open doors because see, I don't have a job. That is a free will that we do things that we have to do our duties as human beings in the society in our families and also with ourselves that is the free will and we pray to god for things that are impossible for us to do what's impossible that we ask the lord to help us the difficult things we pray to the lord to help us to solve But those basic things, we already know that we need to work, that we cannot cross our arms, but we must do something. Otherwise, we die of a starvation or our families starve, but we must be responsible and fulfill our duties. That is free will to make decisions. However, God, he knows our lives. He knows our thoughts. He knows our lives. If we go out and we come in, everything that we do, He knows that. But He doesn't intervene. He lets us to reason, to think, to reflect, that we make decisions, that we close a deal, a job. Sometimes we say, Lord, and this deal, it is of a large amount of money, so please guide me because I don't want to lose money in this deal. Please help me. But if we're talking about small things, it's not necessary. We do things on our own. Yes, brother. Sister, good evening. Thank you very much. I have a simple question. My question is regarding patience. It is something that the Lord is constantly asking me to have. Does the Lord ask you constantly to be patient? Do you acknowledge that you are impatient? Well, I acknowledge that, yes. We are making the brother confess here to all of us. Yes, yes, I, well, I, I acknowledge yes. that the Lord has helped me grow a lot in patience, but I also acknowledge that there are a lot of things that I've made mistakes. I'm sure, surely I've made many of those promises, uh, hold back many of the ones that I fight for, and I see that they are not coming. And the Lord asks me to be patient. So I meditate on it and I say, Lord, am I not diligent? Am I not doing this or doing that? I'm trying not to feel so anxious. Remember that being patient doesn't mean that you should not be diligent. We must be diligent, very diligent, because sometimes people, people get confused and the Lord tells them, be patient, and I cross my arms and I will wait for things to fall from heaven. Yes? So no, I have to be diligent 
I do, as I said, I apply five different times at five different jobs that I know I can do. And then I pray to the Lord and I say, Lord, to open doors in one of those five places that I have applied. And I wait in the Lord. I wait in Him. When God says, be patient, what He is telling us is not to get bitter. There are persons who get sick because they are impatient and they want things now. Now I want my problem to be solved and I want to see. So they get sick. They are stressed. They are depressed. Their blood pressure goes up. Their sugar levels go up. But God doesn't want us to live in that despair, in that anguish, crying and being worried. So the Lord says, be patient. Yes, be diligent. Lord, I have applied five different times. Yes, I know you have applied five different times. Wait, I will open doors in one of those places for the Lord. He wants us to be happy, calm, in peace, with quietness, relaxed. But I am diligent, seeing, applying, talking here and there, trying to solve my problems trying to fix my situation so i talk to people i tell people or i play, pray to the lord accordingly and i wait with much faith and i believe that the lord will help me this is when the lord tells a person be patient because perhaps there's anguish and despair remember that there are many many who haven't known the way of God. I have seen people that when they are impatient about something, they want to solve their problems and they start smoking and they do. <sighs> and the problem is not solved. And they put up one cigarette and then they light up the next one. I, I saw that. I saw that in people. So God doesn't want us to be that way. But diligent in applying and doing things well as long as our human ability allows us to and the lord does the rest of, and that we are happy in the lord can you imagine we were sitting crazy i'll go to a church and get oh and i'm so sad and depressed so where is that church where you say that god gives you happiness where is it so we contradict ourselves so patience that's patience to be diligent But don't get bitter, don't get anguish because you get sick. And God, he wants us to have health. Yes, continue with your question. Well, You've answered my question because I also thought maybe the Lord is basically telling me when you give me, I bless you, or I'm doing my work in you. On Sunday, the sermon was about when the Lord remembered Noah. And so throughout my meditating on that, I was saying, Lord, has it my time not come? The spiritual blessings are the ones that I wish, I mean, everything, of course, but those are the spiritual ones are the ones that I really want, that I fight yes, for. Yes, one, we must put our trust in the Lord to be able to say that I am not impatient because also impatience makes that those who are around us to suffer. Those who are around us, they suffer. And we say, oh, he's so impatient. He's driving us crazy with his anguish, his worries, and his sayings all the time, complaining and lamenting. No, I feel bad. So we may anguish those who are around us as well. This is why God always advises to be patient, not to lose our patience, because we won't solve anything with being impatient. This is why the Lord says it is not about he who runs. No, is that we must leave everything in the presence of God to be diligent in all things of life. And then God, he will solve the rest with the health and the well-being of those who are around us. So this is to be patient, not to get despair, not to rant, because we see that people in the world, they rant and they become angry and they mistreat their children and everybody because they're impatient because they cannot solve their problems or the issues this is why the lord teaches us to be happy 
to believe and to trust in Him, and that we leave in His hands everything for He will help us to solve, and that we are happy, and that we calm down. Let's rise, brothers and sisters. Let's sing to the Lord, and then let's pray to the Lord for healing and for illnesses, for bonds. forevermore we thank you Lord for for your blessings for your promises for your word thank you for your love for your mighty hand blessing us thank you for your comfort that you give us for the support for all those wonders for the liberty for the peace and the happiness for healings Thank you for the liberations, Lord. For you, Lord, you have been healing, healing many, delivering them from spirits of illness, spirits of demons that torment and make people lose their reasoning, their sanity. But you are here, Lord, with your merciful hand, with your powerful hand, acting, performing miracles and signs, our God, Thank you for you listen, for you watch us, for you see us, you promise us, and you are very patient with us. Blessed and praised be your name. We praise you in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. We give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. Blessed you are, my Lord, from everlasting to everlasting. You are our God, our mighty God, our divine God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, your mighty and powerful healing hand on those who are ill from physical illnesses, also psychological, mental Ill's illnesses, that you rebuke all these things, all unclean spirits that come to torment some who come to steal peace, happiness, and joy, Lord, destroy all the work of the devil, and remove the witchcraft, sorcery, curses, and deliver those who are captive, clean the hearts in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved son, we ask you, my Lord, take the brothers, take them well to their houses, protect them from all dangers, protect them from evil, protect them and keep them in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord. Blessed be your name forevermore. Glory to your name. Chorus number six. O Zion, awaken.
Blessed be the Lord. Thank you, Holy Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, glory to the Lord. Glory to our God. And may our God allow our heart to be the temple of the Lord. Is that ark that is here in our hearts, let it be that ark where God dwells. And the Lord may be with us. May God be with all of you and bless you greatly. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. And here are some brothers who are visiting. I don't know if the brother Jorge Bonilla would like to come to.